Uh, the security guard there uh, past the main reception and gents is first one on the right and ladies is the last one on the right hand side. So, um, beer and pizza, help yourself. That was it, I think, from the admin side of things. Um, Amazon Development Centre. Welcome to Amazon Development Centre. You'll probably smell it's quite new, uh, as in it's very, very new, so this is all quite new to me even. Uh, when it went on holiday and came back with a nice new building. So, um, great to be on the map and take part with um, you know, Fangio, Skyscan, and now Amazon on the map as well to do that. So I thought I'd give you a very quick intro to just what we're doing here um, and, and how we're getting on. So, new offices which are great. Um, we're, we're looking to scale this year up to about 150 people. Uh, so this is the sort of smaller meeting suite if you like, the main work is getting done right behind us and we're looking over the next five years to scale up to about 300 people. So, uh, lots of recruitment activity going on. Um, what do we do here? Um, we're, we're looking to be the kind of best place in Europe to work as an Agile um, leader or an Agile engineer. So that's our, that's our aim. And, and as of that, we, we build all our own projects here from start to finish. So we, the, the kind of stuff that we have is all the, the UX, the project design, architecture testing, very much a DevOps type mentality. Despite it being um, obviously a lot smaller than Seattle, it was actually the first development center founded outside of Seattle and maintains that kind of mindset that we get an opportunity to do all our own work um, from here, which makes it very easy and we don't have that kind of co-located working. We do still speak to them, but you know, I suppose <laughs> we need to. Um, so, so what do we do? Um, well, it's a really quite an eclectic mix. It's, it's bizarre, the, the kind of the range that we've got here. Um, everything from um, personalised uh, branding and, and advertising, so the bit that comes up at the end says, um, you know, customers that bought this also bought one of these, then that, that's the guys behind there that are doing that. And it's really great stuff to see that being built out of here with really, really high traffic volumes, very, very low latency, you know, so 40 second, a millisecond, sorry, 40 second, that'd be ages. <laughs> <laughs> that would be easy. <laughs> 40 millisecond bidding time, then that's a wee bit harder. So great to get access to that kind of stuff. And for those kind of projects to be built out of a centre in Scotland, I think it's very cool and not all pinched by Seattle. Um, automated talent and recruiting, so another big project there. In fact, Archie right at the back there is running that programme. But as you can imagine, there's a lot of CVs coming in and there's a lot of talent already in Amazon. So how well can we screen CVs and automate the process of moving people around effectively between teams and getting people in from the outside world? So that again, another uh, different type of project. And the last thing, I'm going to do a shameless plug on what I'm doing here as well. We, we, I run a team who does um, write software to automate the diagnosis of, of actually outages when it does happen. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does happen. Uh, so things like Prime Day and Q4 readiness are a really, really big thing for Amazon. They drive loads and loads of traffic. We have to write software to make sure these things stay in their feet. So that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think that's about it. There's one or two little posters and bits and pieces out there if you want to know more about what we're recruiting for. And don't forget to visit the website of AmazonDC.com, which is probably a little bit uh, more interesting than the main Amazon website, based on the fact that it's all about this development centre, not Amazon as a whole. So you get a much better link for jobs and what we do here. I'll be quiet, pass on to the next person, and I don't have the schedule, so I don't even know who it is. Sorry, Stephen, you need to help me right there. Who's first? Who's first? Yep, thanks, Nikon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank so, you very um, much. Um, right, so the talks tonight, uh, we have, um, who said a uh, Pecha Kucha style before? Oh, you're about to find out. I've never seen a Pecha Kucha style presentation before. We're all about to find out what that is. Um, so, our first uh, speaker tonight is Mark Thompson. Um, from it's got a cool name from We Big Business. I'm the big one. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello to Mark. Thanks, Mark. Cheers, thank you. Great to be here, by the way. Good to see Amazon's new um, offices. Uh, I've got to just fiddle around with this and stick it in here. Fit fiddling. And also, it's lovely to see the youngest Agilist in the whole of Scotland here, which is Alba. So welcome, Alba, who is how old? Nine months. Nine months, that. So I'm Mark Thompson from We Big Business with my colleague and friend, Carrie McAvoy, who's sitting here, someone in the audience as well, hand up. There's Carrie. There he is at the back. Um, so we're nine weeks old, we're a startup, and we help small SMEs um, with growth and innovation, agile innovation and agile approach. That's all we do. Um, so what I'm here to do is give you a, um, a Petrkuch talk. So it's 20 seconds per slide and 20 slides. This is started in Japan, 2003, the Petrkuch meet meetups, and it's a way of cutting through the crap and keeping presentations really specific. Okay, started really by Toyota and developed through more engineering. We had a lot of people talking about different subjects. 
but it's 20 seconds per slide, and that's what we're going to run with today. Okay, I've done one of these before in Glasgow. It's my second one in Edinburgh, so I'm very much testing land. The topic of it is Agile, and, and, and look at the principles of Agile. So we work with a variety of different companies and have done for the last year and a half. But it's really sharing the experiences of what Agile means to them, whether it be methodology or the mindset they have to make Agile work in terms of the grow bed and test bed for that. Okay? And it's also just good fun. It's good fun to be part of these projects. The first thing I want to do is be kind of Marty McFly. But just step back in time and say, right, where, where does the concept of Agile come from? Because to get that context and look back historically, we can then get a more begin. Um, if we look back in time, it started actually with Francis Barron. So in 19, so 1620, <laughs> Francis Barron was um, a physician that looked at kind of testing medical hypotheses. So rather than assuming someone was dying of scarlet fever, he would test why. Then Walter Schuhart in 1930 looked at more of a, a methodology around plan, do, study, and act. So the concept of, of kind of test and learn and think and make. Then in 1950, Deming worked with Schuhart. So he took some of these methods forwards in Toyota and trained a lot of their senior managers about how to do this more effectively. And one of the big gurus of that was Tachi Ono. So he was one of the, I said, the kind of mafia around Toyota. And also it helped develop the X-15 hypersonic jet and Toyota developed their just-in-time system using Agile. That led to 1986 where um, Takuchi and no, uh, Nonaka published the, the new um, product innovation and development game in the Harvard Business Review, and they talked about this concept of relay, so handing the baton on to people, or Scrum, where people all work together and pitch in and help each other out. And that's where Scrum first developed as a concept. That was then taken forward um, by Je really Jeff Sutherland, when he worked in a software company, with a passionate all-black supporter, Ken Schwaber. And they developed the concept, and then in, in basically in 2001, in a little ranch in Utah, 17 Agile has got together and developed the whole concept around Agile methodology. So that is a whistle-stop tour in terms of what Agile methodology, where it grew up and where it um, started. So what I want to do now is look at methodology versus culture, because it's not just the methodology that, that brings Agile to, to life. It's actually the mindset of the people in the business and the structures that support that. And that's what we find in our experience of working, not just with large corporates who can afford expensive consultants coming in and teams, but actually small guys. So take methodology first. If I go into Google, this is kind of what I see if I type in Agile methodology. So lots of different things to different men and women. It could be lean, scrum, so some of the, the, the concepts of Agile. But I can really take what I want and apply it to my company. Okay, that's, that, that's fine, that's kind of easy in a way. What's harder is actually thinking about the mindset. Okay, so a really good quote here from Albert Einstein, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's embracing a different way of thinking about things that can help us. It, it doesn't matter if you're a startup or you're a Clydesdale Bank or RBS. It's the mindset of the individual that is the, the birthplace of, of coming up with new and different things. Um, and this is what we can really help with. But it's not easy at all. There are several barriers that you can face. So... Um, whether you're large or small, it can be people, it can be the structure that you've got, so departments not talking to each other at all. It can be lack of time, you know, I haven't got time for it. It can be mindset. It can be legacy, so it's just what has always happened in the company. Why should we change and develop and grow? For big companies and corporates, that can be really, you know, a, a real hindrance. So when does the magic happen? So I'm leaving you here with some principles. So the first thing is Agile. We'll try new things. So Agile works best when you've got this really open mindset and culture and being able to give it a go, try new different things. So the president here being Starbucks, where they give their customers a chance to try and come up with new ideas and concepts that they test and learn in store in that environment. So the first big principle there. The next one is operating as one. Agile definitely works best when you've got a team there that, that know each other, that work together, that are from different departments. So here the president being Twitter, where they operate rooftop meetings, they've got a very flat structure. But that supports the, the whole birthplace and grow bag of Agile being successful. It's how they operate as a unit and as one. So again, really important. We'll move fast. So one in five of us in this audience will buy gluten-free products. Okay, it's a big emerging marketplace. Genius have done really well to adopt that and really embrace it fast. But it's about being quick and rapid, again, not being slow and mundane. It's about taking risks and being brave and going after new trends and just testing and iterating as you go along. It's about making decisions. So if you look at Larry and Sergey in, in Google, 
you know, they have very much a structure that supports basically quick decision making and making stuff really quickly. So that helps companies really cut through, again, a lot of the, the rubbish and support, be able to react fast to trends that are happening in the marketplace. And that's coming from a senior audience as well. But that's really important when it comes to advocating Agile as a, as a methodology. It's being ruthless, it's cutting through the crap. It's avoiding things that are necessary. So when it comes to designing certain elements or feature sets of a customer experience, it's staying true to the ones that you've tested with customers that are important and bidding the ones and being ruthless about it, the ones that will make a difference. Okay? So being ruthless again and making those decisions and having that autonomy being important. Chris Froome, just won the Tour de France for a third time. Probably good shooting for Sports Personality of the Year. But again, David Brailsford, it's about looking at every little element that can make that greater impact. So innovation can relate to processes, just doing stuff differently. For SMEs, they don't get agile as a word, but they do get thinking differently, doing things differently. And again, that's the principle of what agile is about. We're on Amazon today. It's madness not to even mention a guy like Jeff Bezos, but it's about putting the customer at the heart of everything. So in projects that we run, we're constantly looking to test and iterate and bring in that customer feedback. We're doing a project with Standard Life a few months ago, but we're out in George Street and Prince Street filming customers, taking them a concept of a promise and getting feedback and then iterating that the next day. Um, and it's keeping going, being resilient. So Ben there left Google, went to Pinterest, and they had a, an amazing journey about firstly having the balls to make the jump from Google, getting investment, testing, iterating, and it takes him to where he is today. But being brave as well and making those decisions and working together. But again, I think a good president, whether it be Airbnb, Pinterest or whatever. So guys, that's me, that's Petra Kutra as well. It's been fast, it's been stimulating. Thanks for being a great audience. And if you want to follow up, that's our contact details. Thank you. And if you want to tweet us at WeBake, we're nine weeks old, we could do with some more audiences, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That's, I'm amazed at the synchronicity of that. that itself is agile. I keep it in the sense of the We're on to the next. So, um, I, I didn't explain the, the whole rough plan tonight. Uh, um, we've got an hour lightning talk coming up with, uh, with Russell. Then we've got Suzanne uh, with a medium sized talk. Then we're going to have a bit of a break. Uh, I think there's still some. There's maybe still some beers in the fridge, maybe, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we've got our, our final talk with, with, with Scott. Um, then we've got open mic. So just, uh, again, back to the thing I mentioned before about any ideas or suggestions. At the end, we've got open mic, open for anybody to come up and say anything they want. I know there's somebody going to talk about a hackathon that's happening soon, um, but if there's anything else anybody wants to mention or share with the group, uh, that's that slot towards the end of the night. And then after that, probably across the road to our old haunt, the Guildford, for those that fancy that. Um, so next up is uh, uh, Russell Murray, who's going to do a, a lightning talk and he'll explain more about himself and the talk. Okay, thanks Russell. Cheers. Keep your laptop now. It's all right. So I'm, I'm not as tall as Mark, um, but I've got a bigger laptop. Um, however, 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 it, it makes it harder to see over and probably hide behind it. El Presidente. So, let me pop this in. It's a Windows laptop. So popular in the 90s. Right. Hello. Um, my name's Russell. Russell Murray. I am... Um, I been an Agile coach, consultant, scrum master, waterfall project manager, waterfall um, program manager in the last 10 years. Okay. Um, tonight is a bit of an experiment for me because I usually do workshops and never talk. Right? So that's, that's one experiment. So I'm, I'm looking for some good feedback, whether that's good or bad feedback. Um, the content itself is um, not controversial. But, but I have seen some, yeah, that's obvious kind of feedback before. And I've also had some thought leaders with a Z tell me that, no, that's not how you do Scrum. So um, that's fine. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> another experiment for me.
I just stop a lot and think and people dive in and whatever. So the drones are actually for me to know what I'm talking about and they, they might help you follow what's going on as well. And finally, just to make it more interesting, a new bit of technology as well, which I haven't used before. So what can go wrong? <laughs> if, if it does go wrong, I'll be blaming the technology, okay? So three practical ways to trigger better, great agile behaviours. I'm actually going to record this as well, so just give me a second. Um, I'm going to record it myself. Give it a second. So, three practical ways to trigger great agile behaviour as well. I'm going to start with, can you actually trigger agile behaviours? Some people don't think so. Okay. Um, I've seen it myself five years ago. I saw a team transform literally overnight, actually during the day, from morning to afternoon. Um, couldn't believe my own eyes, but they literally went from practicing Scrum, going through the motions, a bit of a user story factory, in fact, um, and they had a grab bag of practices and techniques. BDD was the favourite one, because it was new back then. Um, Kanban, um, DevOps, you name it. And I saw them go from that in one day to exhibiting agile behaviours. They weren't thinking about the, the Agile Manifesto, they weren't thinking about the principles, they weren't trying to follow them slavishly. For a year, um, you've got four weeks to save that project. For a lot of us contractors, that means you've got four weeks to save your jobs. We've all been there, right? Um, I've, I've been there and seen 350 people lose their jobs, right? So what I'm talking about is pressure, unacceptable pressure, but it really, really matters. I'm not advocating that. Let's get that straight. So what did the team do? Team of 10, I just, I just joined them. So this slide takes a little bit longer. They went for lunch, reeling from the shock of what they just heard from a stakeholder who descended out of nowhere, typical seagull. And I thought, well, what did she actually say? She said, you need to start delivering. Need okay, well, let's give them exactly what they want. So let's find out what they want. So they've got the stakeholder back in the room. And say, what do you want? Just tell us one thing. If there was only one feature in this project, what would it be? That's easy. It would be X. Okay, can we do that? Yes, but there's some risk. How do you get 10 people working on one thing? That's interesting. Well, you're going to have to start swarming around the work, right? They had no choice. They'd gone from working on 10 user stories, one each almost, to 10 people working on one. But the backup user story as well, don't get me wrong. Um, but to be very, very clear on what we meant they'd done, to know how to finish something, that generated lots of things that other people could do. It wasn't just developing. There was some testing, there was arranging a user test. That takes work, right? So they're very, very clear in quality. And they realised in four weeks, they didn't have time to rely on dependencies. So they went and actually got the people that they needed to come and join their team. All they were really doing was, was not living with what they had been living with in the past year. So they actually made the leap from living with all the crap which you're usually expected to live with, and gone, actually, you're allowed to go and do whatever we want. And the gloves are off. We've got a clear goal. There's, there's no one telling us what to do. We'll just check that it's going to fit the bill. Then I looked at the risk in the work, and I thought, you know, we don't want to you know, waste even one week going down a dark alley here. We want to make sure that if there's any integration work in this user story, we want to make sure that they take that out first. So they did. They went and spiked all the risk. In the first user story. Fantastic. Um, that sounds great. Terrible situation. Terrible. You know, people in fear for their jobs. But when they look back, they talk about it being a rush and they talk about moving with a purpose and achieving great things. Right? So there's something there. That's all I'm saying. Right? Um, and, and your scrum values, you know, you can pretty much chop them off. You know, um, courage and respect and all these things. Where's the respect? So when we got ourselves out of Dodge, we looked at 
what made the difference? What made us jump to light speed kind of thing? And you know, we weren't trained, we stopped focusing on practices. There's no coaching, there's no coaches. I wasn't the coach at the time, I was a scrum master. Um, nobody talked about scrum, no one talked about BDD. We just knew what to do. And it was because they had this massive purpose and they hardly had any time, right? So they were constrained, so they had to get creative and rally around. You know, we've all been there. So this talk is really about how do you create positive pressure. So here we go. Number one, any product owners in the room? One, two, three, four, five, quite a few. Okay. Um, Product owner is customer, what does that mean? So I'm used to <coughs> consulting, I work with lots of companies now, speak for me. Um, I'm used to coming across product owners who are usually subject matter experts on a subject, right? They probably have 0% say if they think a project should be stopped, right? Absolutely no changes of direction allowed. They have no control over the budget. So what, what decision making powers do they have? The role of a product owner was originally conceived um, by, I'm not sure if it was Jeff Sutherland or, I think it was Jeff Sutherland, mm. to cut across all the hierarchy and departments in a company, to actually lead a team to deliver something. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, just leave the team alone to self-organise. Well, that's BS, right? The, the customer is probably the role model for a team. And that's, that's probably the biggest, my, my biggest revelation, which I've had and usually causes most, most um, angst for development teams, especially um, DevOps cultural type teams, sorry. Um, the purpose that a customer, that a, a product owner who acts like a customer, who can stop the project that feels like it's their money they're spending, is that they want value for money, right? It's, it's the ageless transaction relationship. I'm giving you some money. Can I have something for it? That leads to a couple of really simple behaviours from a customer. Um, whatever happens, don't turn up with 10 half-finished things at the end of the sprint. I'd like to see a, at least a couple of things come out of it. I would prefer it if you did one, then another, and then another, and then another. Right? Okay. Um, and I'm going to go off and work out what I want to buy. But there are loads of voices in my ear called stakeholders. There's probably technology, and there's probably the company, and it's not just about users. And that's going to lead to a team, not in a nasty, you know, end of the world scenario, but they are going to focus on flow. They're going to focus on, you know, one or two things. It's the same kind of scenario, but it's sustainable this time because it is actually someone who isn't going to burn you because they know that you have to work with them in the next sprint and the next sprint the next sprint and they're going to go and reconcile stakeholder priorities there's always a question mark over value over quantity right absolutely always we'll come to that how to get in charge don't abuse it right we're all going to let you know when you're abusing it let's charter what that actually means let's explore it with everyone you work with you're it you will work for her now Right? But it's a transaction-based relationship. This is one of my favourites. Who works in a team that, at the end of every sprint, gets found out by real people that would use their output? One, two, three, I feel like an auction here now. <laughs> okay, so a pattern that I see are development teams working away in a bit of a user story factory. Things get accepted, they get checked in, and they hear on the grapevine from a product owner or a UX team that carry out focus testing, for instance, or an operations team that give you a digest of a forum what the feedback was. Now that, I mean, why rob the team of the motivation? Right? Why, why do it? As a developer or anything, if I do something, I'm never going to 
be satisfied until I see whether it worked or not. No, it's, it's second-hand information. It usually gets processed into user stories. BS, it really is. This is getting a bit ranty. So, the purpose of users and stakeholders every week or two weeks, everyone your sprint is, is to look at stuff, right? This is great. This is genius, I know. Um, because there's 10 of them, or five of them, whatever, because it's not just one, there's quite a few of them there. This is great for driving the team behaviour because if they turn up empty-handed, it <laughs> doesn't look good, does it? So it actually drives them to focus on flow, and it's completely natural. It is. So if you, if you put them in front of your users, they will naturally focus on flow without anyone patronising them, telling them about, you know, reduce your work in progress and check your cues. You know, it, it doesn't have to be like that. Then there's that, we all know what bias is, right? You can argue with a product owner. You can argue when there are 10 people who don't know how to log into your software, right? Um, or why did you fix that? This is the big problem over here, right? That's absolute classic. Um, there are important impacts here. Yes, the team are motivated to focus on flow. They are. Yes, it's sustainable. It's every two weeks, right? But this is the kicker here. The team will be humble when they get found out, when they actually see how their software is being used. It's a very sobering experience to think that you're great at doing something and then you know, somebody has no idea how to start using it, right? And from that point, you, you realise that you need to seek insight. Not employ a UX person who's a specialist in asking questions about insight. Seek insight. You start asking questions, not just showing things. So you turn up and say, this is what we're thinking about doing next. You might not even finish something. You might just say, we did this to see what you think of it. It's a pretty rudimentary form. It's an experiment. How do you achieve that? Well, you just have a team in the show and tell, and you have users and stakeholders in the show and tell. Um, my personal favourite is asking them to arrange the show and tell, so it's their party. You know, you can cancel a coffee date, but you can't cancel a, a big party of 10 people turning up, right? Everyone needs to eat and they're very music. Um, and it's about taking responsibility. What's this got to do with Agile? Remember, it's, it's all to do with purpose and time. Every two weeks, it's put up or shut up. And if you, if you stop delivering, you're on a hamster wheel, if you stop delivering, they will lose trust. And so they should. If you need to refactor, it's okay. You can say to them, we're slowing down. You know, we need to, we'll be released planning anyway, right? Because we're all doing Agile really well. Tangible reason worth striving for. Okay. Not very pleased with this picture. It doesn't really get the, the thing across. Um, Laz isn't here tonight, and I wanted to ask him this question because it was him that gave me the idea for this talk. I asked Laz, um, you know, how how often do people in teams know directly what happens as a result of working on the user story that they're working on? You know, who who gets what out of it? Be a user. How does the company indirectly benefit? How does the team benefit? And how do the individuals in the team benefit? And we talked about it and pretty much put the world to rights, there was no being involved. But um, talking to others afterwards, there's a common pattern here that I see. Um, user stories are all about users, we're customer-centric. And um, well, we kind of know how the company benefits, and we have no idea how we benefit at all. Contractors get renewed, and there's this weird performance review thing that goes on for permanent staff. Right? Um, visions are, you know, flashy things that go in cupboards, stay on hard drives. Business plans are really what drive things and they are never followed anyway. No one's ever checked. It doesn't feel very real, it doesn't feel very tangible. Um, not like, by the way, in four weeks we're losing your job unless you get with it, right? So all this picture is meant to show is um, there are three, mouths, um, three voices at the table. Right? Um, and if you can't work out, if you can't reconcile why you're coming into work on Monday morning, um, then you've got a problem. Because then you've got 
each individual's own view of what they're trying to achieve, then you've really got problems. Because everyone is in denial. Everyone hates design, everyone hates operations, and we hate them. Okay, now where we go. So the purpose is the three benefits. The impact is um, we can bring it to work in the morning. We're not just turning out user stories. Um, everybody wins. It's fair. It's, it's an interesting one. But most importantly, let's do it. So to be part of a team that moves to a purpose, knows that in a near-term situation, in, you know, in one month from now, we're going to do this thing, and it's going to cause that to happen. And we hope that the chain of events is, it benefits them this way. And last time, we had a, an impact mapping um, session at Skyscanner. Um, and that was all about um, what I'm talking about, actually, which is um, a causal link, an understandable causal link um, between what we're trying to achieve and what we're going to do about it. Right? Um, oh, but impact mapping can be abused like you wouldn't believe as well. You know, let's have no one involved in doing the work involved in that. Let's have product managers and business people involved. All done behind the scenes. Turn it into user stories. There you go. Can you build that, please? That tends to be um, a pattern that I see. How do you achieve it? It's, it's easier to do than it is to set up. You have to get the right people in the room and you write the word success up on the wall. Right? And you just, just lock the door. It takes a day. Um, and you need to understand what people want and you need to understand whether it's at odds with anyone else and you need to align all that. Um, those people will become your show and tell group, they will become your stakeholders, they have agreed to a common why. Um, and my personal favourite is every single user story that you write or work on or talk about after that, you can walk over to this thing that you produce with the stakeholders, you can go, so that, and then you can go, how does that tie into any of this stuff? I don't care who you are, I'm, I'm not doing that, that doesn't help. Why are you asking me for that? We've got a problem, let's go right back to the basics. Why are we here? I'm done. Thank you. It's no fire alarm. Beer. Thank you, Russell. Um, should, any questions? I should have offered that after. Mark. Any, any points of questions yet? I love the. I think the new technology trying out was the slides there and how it's rotating round. Is that the? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's quite amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Our a uh, next talk is a sort of short talk from a uh, Suzanne Morrison who will let her introduce herself and our topic. Okay. Thanks. So just a little bit about myself first, um, I'm from here in Edinburgh, I work at Skyscanner just about 15 minutes up the road from here. Um, I work as an Agile coach and I've been at Skyscanner now for about four years and I was a developer before that. Um, my first role in Agile was as a Scrum Master and when I look back I just think what a terrible, terrible Scrum Master I was, it actually makes me cringe sometimes. But the good thing is it's given me lots of fodder for this presentation so there is a positive out of it. Um, so in case you can't remember what the seven deadly sins are, I'll just give you a quick reminder. So we've got sloth, pride, greed, lust, gluttony, wrath, and finally envy. So when I came up with the idea for this talk, I thought it's going to be really easy to map on deadly sins onto things that go wrong in retrospectives or dysfunctions of teams. Um, but it actually was a lot more difficult than I thought. I mean, for example, I don't know about you, but I've never witnessed lust in a retrospective yet. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought really hard about it for a while, and then I decided to cheat a little bit, um, and I made up some of my own deadly sins. So you'll be pleased to know I've kept um, four of the originals. So I've got sloth, I've got boredom, pride, wrath, gluttony, forgetfulness, and ignorance. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk you through how do you actually recognise these deadly sins when they're happening in your retrospective and what can you do to put a stop to them. Um, and more importantly, what, what can you actually do to prevent these things from happening in the first place? So I'm going to start off with one of my favourite ones, which is sloth. 
Um, so symptoms of sloth, all talk, no action. So you probably see people having a good old moan, letting off a lot of steam, which can be very useful. Um, but if they don't make any improvements, there's not really any purpose to having that retrospective in the first place. So my remedies for sloth. So first of all, a really simple one is time boxing. If you're familiar with any agile practice, you'll know about time boxing. But what I'm talking about here is if you're the facilitator actually planning in advance your time boxes for the retro, I find the brainstorming part doesn't take much time. So it doesn't take long for people to think about what's going wrong. It doesn't take long for people to think about what's going well. But what does take the long time is actually coming up with good improvements that the team can make. So just make sure you've got enough time in there. I've certainly been guilty even recently of sitting there going, oh shit, I've only got five minutes left and the team haven't come up with any ideas for improvement. So it's really good just to think about this in advance. The other one is use the task board. I've seen teams come up with ideas for improvements and they just kind of hide them away on a spreadsheet somewhere and everybody forgets about them. So actually use your task board, whether it's a physical task board or if it's a, an electronic one, just put the improvements in there um, and everyone will see them every day in the stand-up and they'll be much more likely to actually do something about them. And the final one is just take a little bit of time at the start of your retro and say, what were the improvements that we made the last time? Did they actually work? If they didn't work, why not? Um, and if you get into the habit of that, then that's going to make it much more likely that people will actually make the improvements. The next one's boredom. Um, you might have come across this before, just a general lack of energy, or not another retrospective. Um, lack of enthusiasm, kind of falling asleep in the room. Um, you might find that people are discussing the same thing again and again, talking about what they talked about three retros ago. Um, or it might just be that they use the same format over and over again. So remedies for this, this is uh, something that you probably don't have any excuse um, for, for going wrong. So just mix it up. There's so many different formats you can use. You're probably familiar with some of these ones. You know, stop, start, continue, repeat, avoid, what slows us down, what speeds us up, um, the four L's, which is something like loved, lacked, learned and longed for. One that I really like is using themes. So when you have a retro, actually focus it on a specific theme. So say, let's talk about today how we can improve our daily stand-up. Or let's talk about how our remote teams can work better together or how we can do better estimation. Um, and that just makes it a lot more targeted and focused. Um, another one that I like to do, and it's a kind of a good test to see if the people in the team remember what the Agile values are, is just put the Agile values up on the wall um, and ask people what happened in the last iteration that helped you to kind of fulfil one of these Agile values. And you can use that to open a retro or you can use it as a full retro and see what didn't we do, um, what went against the Agile values. Um, and another one which has become one of my favourites is uh, something called De Bono's Six Thinking Hats. And this is um, a guy called Edward De Bono, who's known as a lateral thinker. And he's got a really good technique that you can use for problem solving um, as an individual or as a team. And what you do is you put a metaphorical hat on. So, for example, if you have a white hat on, you can only speak based on facts and data. If you have a red hat on, you can only speak using your gut instincts. If you have um, a black hat on, you can only be critical. So what you can do is you can time box your retro, have a few minutes for each hat, um, and then at the end use the, the green hat to come up with creative ideas to kind of solve the problems that you've come up with. Um, if you're lacking for ideas, I really highly recommend this book, Agile Retrospectives, by Esther Derby and Diana Larson. It sits on my desk at work and I just kind of have a peek into it whenever I'm needing some inspiration. And also the first URL there is called Retromat, and this is a brilliant site for just getting ideas of how to open a retro, how to kind of gather data, how to close a retro. Um, so there's plenty of ideas out there, so there's no reason for doing mad, sad, glad every single time and just boring everyone to sleep. The next one is pride. So you might sometimes find that some people in your team have a sense of self-importance. The things that I say are the most important things. Everyone should listen to me. Um, or it might be that people are have a fear of kind of admitting what went wrong. Um, they, they're a bit ashamed of admitting what went wrong. Or it could just be that they don't acknowledge the rest of the team when they do good work or other teams when they help them. So a few remedies for this one. So first of all, you could do something called a 360 degree appreciation at the beginning of a retro, where you just take five minutes for people to actually tell each other what they appreciate about each other. Um, and we have these little notes at Skyscanner that we sometimes use to you know, write notes to people. Um, the other one is just think about who you're going to invite to the retro. I mean, I've found if you have line managers in there or perhaps the CEO, people are probably going to hold back just a little bit. They're not going to kind of get things out there. Um, and then the other one is skillful facilitation. So as a facilitator, you, you're going to notice if somebody's really dominating the conversation. So trying to make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak and that you're able to point out in a neutral way, you know, if somebody's kind of got that self-importance going on. The other one's wrath. So thankfully, this is one that I don't see very often. I don't normally see it at Skyscanner, so it's all good. 
Um, but this can be kind of, the symptom of this can be negativity. So of course in a retro you're going to talk about some negative things, you're going to talk about positive things, um, but if it gets all too negative, you know, that, that can be quite damaging. The other one is blaming others, so not, not taking the responsibility when something goes wrong, um, always looking for somebody to blame. And the final one is conflict. I always think that it's really good to have conflict in a team, it can be really healthy, um, you can get lots of diverse opinions and lots of debates going on, but if it gets uh, destructive and gets very personal, that can be really damaging and it doesn't end up you know, in a good retrospective. So some remedies for this one, so some of you might have come across something called the Retrospective Prime Directive, um, if you haven't you can Google it and you can um, you know, print it out. So I sometimes like to read this at the beginning of a retro just to kind of reassure people that you know, we believe that people have the best intentions when they do things. When we're, when we're critiquing stuff, we're thinking about how we can improve things going forward. We're not looking to blame other people. The other one is a safety check. So this is a good one if you, you're not really sure whether or not the team are happy to share things with each other. So what you do is you ask people to rate from one to five how safe they feel to share things with others in the retrospective. Um, so one would be, I really don't feel comfortable and I want to get out of this room as soon as possible. Um, and five would be I'm really happy to, to share anything or talk about anything. Um, and you might find if, if a lot of people on the team are rating um, a one or a two, you might not even want to go ahead with the retro. You might want to do a bit of kind of discussion with these people and find out what's behind it. Um, or it might be that you can do a retro, but you maybe can't get much out of it. You're only really scratching the surface there. Um, and the other one, again, I'm mentioning facilitation again. Um, but two things here, one is planning the retro so that there's enough positive and negative stuff and there's a good balance, it's not just all about the negative. And also as a facilitator, being able to point out to somebody when they're being really negative or really personal towards some, somebody, you can do it in a neutral way so that it's not kind of really pointed and accusational. The next one is gluttony, so this was my favourite one when I was a new scrum master. I think the first retro I did was something like that, it was a bit of a disaster and I kind of felt like I had to try and help the team solve every problem. Um, so this is when you feel like you're trying to talk about everything, you're trying to fix everything. Um, or it could just be that you're assigning too many actions, you come out of the retro and you've got 20 actions for your next sprint. Um, or it might just be that you've, you assign all the actions but you never complete any. So my remedies for this one, really speed up. So really obvious just prioritize give the team three dots each ask them to put them on the things that are most important to them and then prioritize them for discussion and improvements the other one is focus so if you just pick one thing or two things that you're going to improve there's a lot more chance of you kind of having an impact compared to if you pick 10 things and then get them all half finished um, and the other one is just accepting so i kind of felt really bad when i couldn't solve all the problems as a new scrum master um, but after time, you just have to accept that you can't, you can't solve everything at once. Um, if it's really important, it's going to come up again in another retrospective. It's not going to be forgotten anyway. The next one's forgetfulness. So this could be just forgetting what happened in the last project or the last release, or even worse, what happened in the last sprint. I sometimes go to a daily stand-up and people can't remember what happened yesterday, so <laughs> it can be a bit of a problem. Um, so remedies for this one. First of all, if you're doing Scrum, don't skip the sprint review. A lot of people, it seems to be a favourite meeting for some people to skip, but by demoing the software, um, by getting feedback about what work has been completed and what hasn't, that's going to be a good refresher and help you with your retro. Um, you can also do something called an emotional seismograph, which is very touchy-feely. Um, I tried this with a, there's a team at work that I like to experiment on. Um, so I, I got them to do this one morning, it was a Monday morning, and basically you've got happiness at the top, sadness at the bottom, you plot a few things that have happened in your last iteration, and then you get each team member to kind of draw where their emotions were over the course of the sprint. And it can just be really interesting to see the differences in how the team are feeling. And it can also be a really good way for kind of people to remember what happened in the sprint and also just a kind of good icebreaker to start things off as well. Um, the other one is the mailbox retro. This is really where you set up a post box for forgetful people and they just put in stuff like, you know, things that are going wrong in the sprint, ideas that they have for improvement. And the idea is at your retro, you just open up the mailbox, be it an electronic one or a physical one, and you start reading out the stuff from the mailbox and talking about potential improvements from that. Um, and then the final one, if you're doing a retro for a big release, you might want to do what we call like a kind of a release timeline or a project timeline so this is one that I used for a, a mobile app project it's a new mobile app and it lasted about seven months of development so what we did is we just kind of plotted key things that had happened of course of, over the course of seven months like new features that have been developed or people that had joined the team um, so hopefully all of these things together will help with the bad memories in the team
And then finally, ignorance. I think this is probably the worst one of all. Um, and when I say ignorance, I mean the ignorance of the benefits of actually doing a retrospective in the first place. So this could be dropping the retrospective when things seem too busy, when there's a deadline looming, um, which, which is probably one of the times when it actually does matter. Um, and also not having retrospectives at all. So it might be that you've, you just don't see the value of them, the team doesn't see the value of them, so you decide not to bother. So my remedies for this one. Um, so first of all, if you're working as a kind of scrum master or an agile coach, just being able to continually educate um, teams on the why behind what they're doing, on the agile values, the importance of continually improving is, is a good way to help with this. Um, the other one is a bit of one-to-one -one coaching. You know, if people don't want to do retrospectives, there's probably a reason behind that. Um, and what I found in the past is sometimes it can be somebody has been in a team before, they've done retros and it's just not worked or they've never made any improvements, so there's a reluctance. So sometimes a bit of coaching to understand why um, can help people to change their minds or be willing to try something. Um, and the final one, really simple, just put it in the diary. Uh, people expect it to happen every two weeks. So I've talked about lots of negative things, but hopefully there have been some ideas for kind of positive things and improvements as well. So I just wanted to finish off by talking about what I think are the seven signs of a great retrospective. So the first one is a feeling of safety. If you don't have that feeling of safety in the team, you're not going to be able to get very deep and solve the really important things that matter to the team that are going to help them. Um, constructive and honest discussions. It's good to have debate, it's good to disagree, but it has to be done in a constructive way, not in a personal negative way. The whole team speaks. So I've been in meetings before where you know one or two people dominate the conversation. Um, so perhaps designing a structure for the, the retrospective that encourages everyone to, to talk. Um, having enough time, I still have this from time to time. I go, you know, I've not got much time left. We're not going to, you know, get get any actions. I think occasionally it's good to just have that discussion where people get to hear their views and understand each other. Um, I had a retrospective recently where we didn't really come up with an action, but the team felt really good because they had understood each other and they've got things out into the open. So sometimes, you know, it's good to do that. Um, but just making sure you've got enough time to come to actions when you do have the retrospectives. Um, Checking the previous actions, so having this regular kind of um, checking what, what, what you did last time, what you improved, um, did it work or not, just making sure you're getting benefit out of doing the retros. Um, also recognising and celebrating the positive things, so it's not all doom and gloom, it's not all about things that you're doing badly, there's also the good things that you've delivered or the improvements that you've done that have worked well. Um, and finally, agreeing some changes, so the whole point of doing the retrospective is to actually make change, make positive change and improve the way that you work together. Um, and just finally, touching on the agile values, so um, doing regular retrospectives helps you to become more agile. You've got an agile value there about people and, and interactions. The retrospective's all about looking at how these people are interacting together and improving that going forward. And then the agile principle, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective and then tunes and adjusts its behaviour accordingly. And that kind of perfectly describes what a retrospective should do. And that is... Me. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or in the pub later on. Um, you can tell me whether you've experienced lust in the retrospective or not. <laughs> Thank you. Was I said it was agreed, was it? <laughs> and I drink. Yeah. So I think we're uh, thanks very much, Zan. So uh, I think we'll have a break, uh, say a 10 minute break, if you want to, I think there's some beers left, uh, some drinks, and uh, we'll gather back for a final talk from Scott, um, see you back in 10 minutes, thanks. Should we get 15 then? Yeah, okay, 15.
Okay, um, our final talk tonight is from a, a Scott Seafright. Um, I've known Scott for a, a good number of years now. Um, from We worked together at a financial organisation and uh, Scott's an agile coach at, at Clydesdale at the moment and he's going to give a talk related to SAFE. So I'll pass over to Scott. Yep, so the screen's going off. I'll try this. I think it might be the cable. Yeah, yeah let's try this one. Right, I didn't actually need the screen first of all because I thought you're all going to be happy after a beer and you're all going to be relaxed after several talks. So what I want you to do is stand up. Shut your eyes. It gives me the access to some time to get the screen working. <laughs> <laughs> this is always a good one to... Anyone got any ideas about the screen? No? Right. Anyway, what I want you to do, shut your eyes everyone, and I want you all to point north. Okay, keep your hand up. Open your eyes and look at yourselves. Pitiful. <laughs> <laughs> any scouts here? Yeah? Now, why don't we just keep your hand up where it was, right? If you're fairly sure you know where north is, keep your hand up. Everyone else put your hand down. Right. Okay. Now, everyone, look at those people that still got the hand up. Yeah. Now, what I want you to do is close your eyes. Okay, and I want you to point north. Your colleagues. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we are social animals. So I'm going to be talking about the lean agile mindset. I can sit down now. Um, I could do with a hand with the screens though, because I can't do that for half an hour. Could be, could be in trouble. So, so what I want to explain to you what was going on there is more intelligent than anything we could do with networks and self-healing networks and artificial intelligence and everything else. I got a room full of people that don't have the same interfaces that all came into the same room, yeah, and you all calibrated by the wisest people in the room, having done a value, how, you know, an AI assessment. That's the you know that's which would be the best way to do it, and then you all agreed. Now, I didn't need a process, I didn't need a manual, I didn't need a voting system. Yeah, we all did that automatically. Yeah, this is really good news. We all come with organisation built in. We all come with a standard manual built in, and we all come with the ability to work together built in. What's your name? Right, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> I went out to the street and checked. It's uh, down towards Leith. Yeah, so you all did very well. Round of applause for yourselves. So we're making a longer line than No, we're good. So I'll, I, I'm just going to start off. I am. Um, my background, I've been doing agile coaching now for about 10 years. I've worked at places, I'm at the Kleiser Bank at the moment, I've worked at Tesco Bank. Uh, I've been in the finance sector, I've worked with lots of dot coms in Seattle, which is a completely different market from a UK financial sector market. Uh, and I've worked with lots of uh, organisations through their transition from their existing waterfall, moving forward into, into going into their agile techniques. Uh, one of the things that uh, I I'm going to talk to you about is the, is the mindset and I think that ties in very well with Mark's talk uh, and also the other talks especially about retrospectives and that because I'm a great believer that there's actually more to do in Agile with the mindset than there actually is with any processes so I'm going to do an experiment okay who thinks that's the best tool hands up right come up here <laughs> what's your name Daniel. We can do this without slides. <laughs> Daniel. Thank you. There you go. How do you call you? Daniel Hammer. <laughs> right. Who thinks this is a better tool? I remember as a boy I played one of these all the time. Who thinks this is a better tool? Someone must. Monica? And, and just for health and safety reasons, I'm going to let you know that I put the saw blade the other way around so you can't cut yourself. Who thinks that's a great invention, you know? The best tool. Yeah. 
Now, the three of you, I'd like you to have an argument about which is the best tool. And we'll watch. Because I do lots of lean agile Glasgow meetings and we put lean coffee out, we put stickies up. And you know what the most, every week, no matter who's new or old, you know what one question always comes up? Should I use stickies or Jira? Yeah. <laughs> which is better, Scrum or Kanban? Yep. Well, I'm, we're going to recreate those discussions now. <laughs> <laughs> so, argue amongst yourselves, we're, we're just watching. Okay. Casually in the pub. Uh, three rules of engineering. Always use the right tool for the job. The hammer is the best tool for any job. Rule three, anything can be used as a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> this can be used as a hammer. <laughs> Just take your presentation on the top. Okay. Oh, I think this, this actually precedes the hammer because um, it's normal. Just hammer. Just hammer. <laughs> <laughs> if it's wrong, keep the hammer. <laughs> yes. And then saw. Saw it off. Yeah, I, I think this is a very good intention because uh, actually you can cut up, you can cut down. Even in soil, and uh, you can turn if you need. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's multifunction. This has a fall. Some work, I just leave for others. <laughs> When we get the slides working, we're going to go into a bit of psychology. You're all talking in an adult voice, and I love that. Yeah, because this is the voice that we should talk to. I don't know if anyone went in uh, to see Lean Angel Scotland and Catherine Kirk's speech about we don't want people being happy, we don't want people being sad, we just want people being normal. So, really, thank you very much for a nice structured discussion. I like I, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of my toolkit, though. Really. I think the key thing and the key message is when I'm up here to talk about safe, right? Yeah, it, I see so much arguments and discussions, of, you know, about safe this or dad or less or scrum or kanban or anything. But, but really, tools are tools are for specific jobs. As we're in Edinburgh, I used to work with a friend in Edinburgh, and I knew a surgeon there, um, and I used to call him Mr. Hammer because anytime anyone went to see him with any complaint, they thought the answer was surgery. Yeah. <laughs> It didn't matter whether you could get a chemical treatment or medical treatment or therapy treatment. He thought there's surgery was the answer. I think sometimes we get into that mindset as well. We know one method. Have we got anything? Not yet. No. I had lunch with Clark uh, Ching today, and we're talking about the last conference I went. And his presentation didn't work, <laughs> and he wished me luck today. So. <laughs> 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 Tell him tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Never let Clark Chang wish you good luck. <laughs> right. I'm just going to go through the slides as I go. As, as my prompt. Um, my passion is making work human again. Okay. Uh, it's very interesting that Agile came from the IT community because sometimes IT community is one of the ones with the headphones on. Now as a monitor not really making eye contact or relating. It's surprising that the accountants didn't come up with the Agile, or the, <laughs> or, or the lawyers come up with Agile. Um, and, I, and I think the, the basic reason of that is, is it's so complex. If anyone's doing any software development just now, the one thing you have to know is you can't know it all. You need to work as a team. That team's going to have to use experiences. Um, well... <laughs> Okay, so, I was up to two o'clock in the morning doing these slides. Uh, okay, so, um, is anyone, I'm going to get you to visualise the, the safe floor chart. <laughs> is that, has anyone seen the safe floor chart? Yes. Right, someone describe it for me. <laughs> What's your name? Yeah. Victor. Victor, describe it for me. Uh, In your own words. It's got uh, some portfolio planning at the top, then yep. something about the release trains in the middle, yep. the teams slightly lower below so, that, so delivering so their own backlogs, and there's some governance thingies and the foundations at the bottom. Yeah, so, so about two years ago. <laughs> Sorry, just to get it on. So, so about two years ago, Stephen came to me and went, Ah, I've been at Safe Leadership Course. What do you think of Safe? And I went, Oh, I don't think I like Safe. 
It's all too processy. It's the kind of thing that processed zombies like. Yeah. It's got. And, I, and then I looked at the chart and I got scared because there was too much stuff there, and I got I got fearful. Uh, and I went ah. There's a picture of me going ah. I'm trying to work the visuals in. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, this is getting taped. <laughs> okay, the next slide I've got after that was <laughs> some Japanese writing that I was going to press you with. Okay, uh, and, it, uh, and in the Japanese writing, we are looking at uh, soldiering on. I'm trying to reboot Scott Valley. Okay. So, uh, we could have had more beer. Yeah. So there's there are three Japanese. Everyone knows what Japanese writing looks like. Yeah, and there's uh, and and they are the term shu hari, shu hari, very good. So who knows about shu hari? Victor, you, you only get one go. Come on. Hmm? What's your name? Mike. Mike, what, tell us about uh, shu hari. Uh, well, it's a it was a Japanese word. Yeah. A Japanese word for. Something that quite old, the difference is master, expert, and novice. Yeah. So I used to do karate when I was a thin person. I used to be, when I was at university. And then karate, you did katas. So now, am I moving away from the, those visuals into doing some things for you now? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what you do is you imaginary fight people, and you practice it and practice it to get muscle memory. These are the processes. So I would turn on that, and then I would go forward like that, and then I would go again, and I'd go, ah! And then I would go back. Because someone's attacking me from behind. <laughs> and these are katas. Like, people repeat katas all the time. I remember falling out with the, uh, the sensei once, and he made me 1,000 times do that. You know, like the karate kid, wax on, wax off. Yeah? And then after that, I found my punch, it was much better. And this muscle memory. So, the shoe of Shuhari is. Uh, is about the student, so it's someone who's very new to something. Everyone, a prayer. <laughs> and it's all about embracing the kata and learning the kata. Ha is when you're diverging from the kata, and re is when you've discarded the kata. So I think one of the problems we've got when people talk about safe is if you're a, a re in scrum, so you know Scrum so well, you don't actually have to do it all. You know Kanban so well, you don't actually have to do it all. If I come along and then show you this very complicated thing, that's really a shoe process, it's for new people to it, it's for people learning it, you're going to go, oh, that's too prescriptive, that's... Yeah, so a lot of the arguments about saw, hammer, tool, yeah, it's a lot of people who are reason their own topic, looking at safe and say, well, it's too complicated. Or it's too simple. This picture is good. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my journey so far. Right, what do you think of that guy there? Yeah? It's all about mindset. What's this guy's mindset? Yeah. That's me when I was a program director working in London. At that time, you had to put like a tough face on to go into meetings. And you had to make a show of arguing about your team. And I'll make sure they work hard. I'll make sure we get the weekend. I'll make sure the test is there. And yeah, just for the management, because that's the mindset they wanted. When I got into Agile, I threw all that away. But I was always very interested about where this mindset comes from. I started looking around at a lot of the problems in the industry. Has anyone ever read the book The Games People Play by Eric Byrne? Wonderful. What's your name? David. David, give us a bit of a. What, give us a little summary of the book. Oh, I'm trying to think which. Um, uh, yeah. I can show you on a slide. But transactional I'll... analysis. Yes. So it's um, either parent and adult. Yay! <laughs> so within each person, there's a parent, an adult, and a child. And in any interaction, one of those from you is communicating with one of those in the other person. Yeah, and I found in the project management industry back in the 90s, 
Yeah, the language I was getting from leaders and managers and everything else was very parent. Yeah, you must do this, you must not do that. Uh, in, in the model, the parent voice can be controlling or nurturing. And guess which the command and control picked? The controlling voice. Have you, have you done your timesheet? Remember, you didn't do your timesheet last week. Remember the timesheets are very important. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Is it up and down or? Just side slides. Yes. Thank you very much. That's the picture. Right, that one too. Right, so I'm doing my scrums. I'm very happy. I start looking around. And I'm seeing difficulties, I'm seeing management difficulties, I'm seeing team difficulties soon. I think Catherine Kirk again, Lena just got and started talking about it. You know some people in the team acting oddly and difficultly. Uh, so parent voice can be positive or negative. The adult voice um, is always neutral. Okay? And the child voice can be positive or ne negative. What I was finding was all the communication I got were management here. The team's there. That before I found Agile. Yeah. That mindset is still going on. Uh, was it last year, Stephen? You got called to a meeting with me because the program director wasn't happy that I program manager wasn't happy that I told the team what was happening. <laughs> Why did you tell the team? We told you not to tell the team that we're thinking of having another version. Well, you know what? Let's find out it was a good idea first. <laughs> no, they know that was like more than you do. Of course, Stephen had to go into the canteen and sit through that. <laughs> yeah, so mindset, really important. Rebellious tantrums are difficult. And this, this model actually came from Byrne's work with uh, delinquent children. And a lot of the developers I found before Agile sometimes acted like delinquent children. And that was because it was their only output. It was their only way of fighting back against a system that controlled their wages, their bonuses, and their salaries. What I like about SAFE and what I like about the big group planning is there's a lot of adult talk in it, everyone's equal, there. and you can ask them any question you want, and you can get your ar architectural stuff answered in a second. It's bloody exciting. Much better mindset. So, other things I found back in the days when I wasn't happy. You get this. One agile project in an organisation, but we're agile. Student loans won a prize for being <laughs> government digital <laughs> on one project. <laughs> yeah? The mindset doesn't travel. Um, Taylor, anyone looks at Team of Teams work, will understand about Taylor. Taylor did his work in the last uh, two centuries ago, and everything was industrial. There's a wonderful book uh, which describes uh, just how we've turned people into machines. A guy called John Ruskin, the artist, wrote it in about 1845. And he said, young ladies who buy beads, go to a bead factory. See the shaking hand of the man who makes glass beads. All day he sits and makes glass beads. We have turned them into a machine. Young ladies, do not buy glass beads. Yep. From then on, Ford and everyone else comes in. It turns everything into you know, such a process bit. And now work's not human. In the 60s, knowledge work comes along, and that whole generation there, you know, we can really look back to Snowbird and what they did with uh, Agile and how they started thinking about Agile. But now we're in the creative workspace. Everyone here in this room is a revenue generator, not a cost center. Yeah? So why, does our, why do our organizations still think of you yeah, as cost centers? How can I reduce my software development by 10%? I don't know, I could put it in India. Yeah? You're not working anymore with industrial work. You're working with creative work. So you need a new mindset. Ever, anyone seen this one? Dave Snowden. What Dave Snowden and his model says, we get different types of organization. We've got obvious stuff. So I think and a lot of the work that we did in IT was here's a paper system, let's make it computerized. That was obvious. 
didn't take that much work to do. But they've got complicated stuff. So we really want to do things across several countries, but it's quite simple. Now we're just into the complex stuff. Only knowledge workers can do complex stuff. So back, back in the days, I'm, I'm looking at lots of small teams working together or not together with stories passing together. Um, anyone work in a place like this? Yeah? It's alignment. Remember that? Remember when I got you to stand up and point north? Yeah? I think these guys could point north as to what their vision is or what they should be doing. How, how could that translate to a great step forward for the company? Um, I've seen organizations like this. You get the new CIO in, he calls his heads in, and he, he tells them, my vision is we're going to split the country this way, we're going to do it this way, we're going to do that this way, that's going to be this, that's going to be this. Right, now you've got the vision, go off and do it. That doesn't work. It doesn't work with knowledge workers. My all-time favorite, uh, Gilbert. All the time we talk about you know, getting closer to the business, and then project management getting between us and the business. So you never get near the business. <laughs> What we, were, what we then got really good at doing was starting pilot projects. Let's go back to the student loans. Yeah, Let's do a pilot project. So what you do is you take 20 people, you get 40 contractors in, you get a high paid uh, supply company in, you put them in a different building away from everyone else in the rest of the organization, you get them to run a project, and you go, woohoo, we're agile. Right? We don't need the consultancy company now. And the contractors, you're far too expensive. What are a thousand pounds a day for you? It's all right, we'll take it from here. We'll, we'll go and make the rest of the organization agile. Uh, yeah. So we go from early adopters and then we get a break. I'm guessing quite a few organizations are in that space where you might actually have some agile success and it worked at small scale, but when you try and move it forward, it's struggling even with vision. And DevOps. Yeah, I love DevOps. I think it's amazing. Everyone know what DevOps is? There's three definitions. I'm still working out, but well, I love the idea of working together. I love the idea of automating a lot of the stuff that needs to be automated. And I love the idea of this whole feedback cycle loop because it's taking the stuff that's really quite boring and it's taking it away from everyone. So what you get to work on is the real problems. So. I started thinking about scaling, and about how we scale. I think Tesco Bank was when I started thinking about scaling, because we had lots of good scrum masters and lots of good teams. I just couldn't see how it built up with our corporate vision. I think this is an interesting one as well. I kept going to lean agile meetings, and people would start arguing about, well, a stand-up needs to be 15 minutes. You need to have a retrospective every week. Yeah, We need to do the three questions at the stand-up. Yeah. And I realized that a lot of people were just getting caught up in the processes. And the thing, biggest thing I'd say to the safe is, I'm not going to go through the safe processes today, but don't use the safe as a toolbox, just as I did with the tools. Yeah. Don't try and implement everything the way that the safe manual says. Because what we need to focus on is the mindset. So that's where I got to. Anyone read the chimp paradox? Read it on the moment. Ah, good. wonderful. Come up here. Stand up. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> give Andrew a round of applause, please, for coming up here. <laughs> Woo! I heard the text on this now. Anything you get wrong, right? I am uh, I, yeah, I'm going to put on the, uh, the VTAP website now <laughs> to say that you're a complete fuck up an idiot. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to stop you there. Right? <laughs> Right, I'm going to take you through it. You can uh, no, but stand here. It's a good two piece. Yeah, okay. And, and <clears throat> in the chimp paradox, what it works out, what we talk about is the different brains that have evolved at different times. Okay. Sorry if you're a creationist. Current theories <laughs> in neurology are: we started off with a lizard brain, we then had a mammal brain, and then we had uh, a, 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 what we call our human brain. In the chip paradox, the chap that does that does a lot of work with the Olympic team. And if you, I've got some links here to go to the videos. You can see him, how he worked for the Olympic teams. And we were very successful at the last Olympic. Indeed, yes. Chris Hoy uses uh, 
And what he says is, you've got an ancestral brain, we'll call it the chimp brain. And then you've got your rational brain, and then you've got your computer. And your computer is where you store your data. Good, so far? Yep. Yep, cool. Now, I've got bad news. As soon as I called Andrew up, I activated his chimp brain. <laughs> you went, shit, I'm going to stand up in front of people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen to me? His brain, his brain went, what if I get it wrong? What if Scott hits me? Can I kill him? Can I run out of the building? Do I remember enough? And all the time, as it's running through all the scenarios, it's hammering the computer. Yeah? And it's getting all the data out. And he relaxed a bit. And we've worked together before, so he's quite... He knows I wouldn't... You know, he would, wouldn't he kill me. Whilst yeah, yeah. <laughs> all this is happening, yeah, a message goes to the human brain. And it's a bit like, um, you know, the chimp brain's doing this, 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 this. And the human brain's kind of going like, calm down. <laughs> calm down. Uh, and the, but, the, but the human brain doesn't get access to the computer until the chimp's finished. <laughs> yeah. Interestingly enough, if you ever watch a Donald Trump video, yeah, <laughs> he's talking to the chimp brain. Yeah, that's all he's doing, he's talking to the chimp brain. <laughs> Yeah, so that means like, uh, you know, apparently in the la latest statistic, there's just as many black cops uh, as white cops been killed. Yeah, that information is in here. Chip doesn't want to know about that. It's going black cop, black cop, black cops, because it's listening to the words. Um, I'm not going to go into all of this, but this happens in meetings. This happens at stand-ups. Yeah, you know that bit where you've been fa fast asleep at the stand-up? Or even the stand-ups turned a horrible thing where the PM is trying to use it as an update. He wants to publicly shame you for not delivering your commitment that night. Yeah, that's a, sorry, Andrew. Cool. <coughs> How did I do? That well, was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Good. You can go back. No. <laughs> or you can stand here. <laughs> Mindset. Another great book. Definitely read it. Great for parenting. Guess how I've been using it. Uh, what it says is there's two mindsets. Uh, one is the one that was taught throughout the 1990s, which is uh, look in the mirror and say, I am a champion, I am a winner. Yeah? Uh, it's the one that we got from Tony Robbins and all the sales stuff. I think, I think the only problem was Trump. Uh, <laughs> what, that, what that's about is you are a good person. Yep. And I'll congratulate, what's your name? Joe. Joe. All right, so... Joe, well done in that exam. You're really intelligent. Thank you. What are you now thinking? I made it good. You know, you're thinking, if I didn't do well in that exam, he'd think I wasn't intelligent. <laughs> 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 I'm going to have to do well in exams. <laughs> what, uh, what do I say is in, in this is, instead of saying you've passed or failed, have you passed and you haven't passed yet? Yep. Because what you want to develop is a growth mindset. But the growth mindset says, is, look, I don't know a lot of stuff I'm going to have to learn. When you look at safe, treat it like a, in, in the hole of agile. Because I'm using, I've learned safe last year. If I'm standing here two years' time, I'll probably talk about something else. Because my journey with agile is just learning and learning and learning. If I've got a growth mindset, yeah, if I didn't manage to do something, it was because I hadn't learned it enough. Yeah, if I've got a fixed mindset, if I didn't manage to do it, I'm just useless. And that's the way we teach. And that's the way our school systems go. And that's command and control. Yeah. So use that language in retros as well when you're reviewing things. Right, switch. I'm, I'm throwing all these mental models out. Okay, there's links to everything and the slides will go up. Uh, okay, the elephant, the rider, and the path. Anyone know that one? Hey. Do you want to have a... It's my favourite book. Oh, come on. Yeah. Have you have to come up. <laughs> I, I've stood with so many organisations that have processes that are causing the projects to be late, the people to be unhappy and leave, the supplier relations to be appalling, and everyone's happy with it. Yeah? Yes. And you're going to explain why. <laughs> well, I'm going to explain why... A good, if you're going to do good change management, you need to be engaging both the rational part of people's mind and the emotional part, and also shape the path which is make it easy for them to do it. So you want to get them 
can get excited about why it's a great thing to make this change and also give them some clear direction and steps that you can follow to make this change, very rational, and also make the any barriers that might come up in their path and um, try and remove them or make them as small as possible to make this change. Excellent. I love that. The, the, the idea, the idea of, is, um, it's like Alba, who's little. She's all elephant. Yeah. She's all chimp. She hasn't got the, the rationing. I remember in the chimp paradox, where the, the chimp goes crazy, you know, the, you know, the, the human can't do anything. Which is, that's why the analogy of the elephant's so good. If your elephant goes rogue, it doesn't matter what you want to do saying on top of it. But, but the elephant's quite scared and, and just wants to stay on the path. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want full credit for my co-host tonight. So, yeah. uh, but the elephant wants the, the path. And, and this is the breakthrough for me when I started looking at SAFE. SAFE's a different path to take people from an organization and to try and get all their elephants, whether they be management or analysts or leaders or developers, and try and move them onto a different path. Because the reason people are stuck with the, the, uh, the bad delivery, the arguments, the top-down projects that we spend a year on and then we don't do is because that's the path they're familiar with. So the only way to get our emotions to change yeah, is to change the path. <coughs> I'll just speed through these. So when, I, when Stephen first talked to me about safe, I must admit, I didn't think it was, a, oops, hang on, I've done the bit of only moving one. I didn't think it was like the, you know, the evil consultant showing you the huge and complicated <laughs> diagram. So they give me a hundred million pounds and I'll, you know, I'll do it for you. And the more I got into it, it was a toolkit. Are uh, you actually now seeing where all the demos are <laughs> supposed to fit? Uh, all safe to me is, we've got lean here. And the why we're doing things. But we're all working as a team to work on the why. We've got agile delivery practices. Um, so it's based on Scrum doesn't tell you what Scrum is, because that assumes you know Scrum. You can use Kanban. Uh, but it also yeah, highly uses the DevOps mindset and the automation. Um, I'm not going to go into this heavily, because what I didn't want to do is come in and talk about safe. I want to tell you why we need mindsets and why we need paths and why we need to calm everything down. The Agile Manifesto, which everyone should know and we discussed earlier, that uh, was great. The lean elements that come out of here, uh, the respect for people and culture, the flow, the innovation, the relentless improvement, focusing on the economic case and value, and leadership, really bring something else to it. So if you put those two things together, you've got something really powerful. Um, going back on the timeline, I think Mark spoke about Deming earlier, so that was about systems thinking. Uh, we then went to lean manufacturing, agile software development, now we've got the lean startup because everyone's getting too big and too processy. Uh, and now we're in the bit where we're trying to do whole organizations agilely. And on the whole, we're, we tend to do that badly. Oh, sorry, this, uh, just to go back on here as well. With the mindset, we're moving away from complicated domains. Go back to the bead manufacturer, and we're now moving into the into the how do we do how do I do it on Snapchat? Probably a good answer. <laughs> This is, this is, if you're going to buy one book this year and read it, read this book. I'll tell you everything you need to know about software development. It's heavily used in SAFE material. Read that and you probably sit the SAFE exam. Um, and it's, again, it's about mindset. And I love this one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, a different way of thinking. There's, all of this material on SAFE is available in SAFE. All these case studies are there. These case studies... Each of these shows these individual items. Um, there's principles. So take an economic view, apply systems thinking, assume a variability, build incrementally and fast. All of that very familiar with the Agile Manifesto. If you go to the material, it breaks it down further. For executives, it gets on one page, showing what the benefits are. Um, and it's all about mindset. I'm speeding up because I've taken a bit longer than I wanted to. Uh, but it's worth looking at the patterns and anti-patterns. We need to engage with leaders and organizations. And that's the pointy-headed bosses in Dilbert. Yeah, the, nobody's got any sympathy for the pointy-headed boss in Dilbert. Yeah, but that's a mindset. 
Somewhere they got taught that at a business school, and I think that's a valid mindset. Maybe the the most widely sold business book ever trumps the art of the deal. So they think they need to make a deal all the time. But that's old mindset. We really need to kill it and bury it. Um, and that's what the, that's what I just like. There's a poster there that breaks it down into even more. And what I would say, if you ever think about looking at safe, get that poster off the website. Don't look at the big functional flow one, because that scared the crap out of my elephant. <laughs> okay. Here's sources, again, the slides are up in the meetup. Uh, there's a, the Jim Parabook talk is a brilliant because it's about the Olympics team. Uh, this is wonderful because it's about children. Uh, and, and, you know, do read the first chapter of the book about the ride on the elephant. And I think that was me. Sorry about the talk talking. <laughs> Did I stun you? Are you happy? Okay, just, just for my benefit, out, out of the talk, because uh, it helps me with feedback, if you put five fingers up, if you liked it, apart, and try and see beyond any of the technical problems, uh, one finger was that you didn't, you didn't get much from it. So if you just put a hand up there and I can get an instant rating as to what you thought. So everyone put the hand up and I'll see if I made any. Well, that's good, good average. I was, I was expecting more two fingers, but that's just, <laughs> that's just my office. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Funny, I just, uh, I don't know if anybody else has got kids in primary schools in Edinburgh here, but Carol Dweck with a growth mindset that's used in you know, my, uh, kids' uh, primary school quite a lot now. So it's, uh, I think they're trying to, they're penalty in, in, in loathing, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's a UK wide thing or a Scottish wide thing, but definitely a. Uh, Okay, that's all our, our talks over for this evening. Um, one last thing, uh, which we called uh, open mic on the on the agenda. So it's really a chance for anybody who wants to share something with the rest of the group, be it some other meeting or some information to share. Um, a chance to come up here and, and and share it. I know there's one person who wants to share something on yeah, hackathon. So, uh, uh, and on that note, uh, as you probably noticed, this tonight's been getting uh, live streamed. So, Alan uh, from Product Forge has been live streaming this, and he had live streamed a couple of events ago as well. So, thanks again, Product Forge, for doing that. And over nice. to Alan for a few words. Uh, thanks yeah. so much. Uh, yeah, you maybe know us from uh, live streaming a lot of meetups in Edinburgh. Um, we we also organise hackathons. We're running one this weekend in partnership with Shelter Scotland. Uh, we're looking at issues of housing and homelessness. Um, the whole of the Shelter Scotland digital team uh, will be at the event. Um, we've got the director of Shelter Scotland um, for, the, for the judging. Um, so if you're interested in the topic, if you're interested in the third sector, um, you just want a fun weekend hacking on new projects and in a, in a, in a kind of creative space, then um, uh, if, you, if you've got any questions, then just uh, hit me up. Um, there is a cover charge for the event, but anyone who's here tonight, um, come up to me and I'll, I'll give you a discount code. Um, for the event. Um, uh, something that's come up, and I'll address this kind of a weird one um, a few times, is that um, you're not doing work for Shelter Scotland over the weekend. Um, anyone who, who turns up, you own all of your own IP. Um, the hope is that some of the projects will be taken forward beyond the weekend, but that's entirely up to you if you want to do that or, or don't do that. Um, but certainly Shelter are there to um, support any projects if that happens. Um, so yeah, that was it. Thanks so much. When is the event again? Um, it's oh sorry, it's a Friday, from this Friday to to Sunday at Codebase. Um, so it runs twenty four hours. You don't have to be there twenty four hours. If you can't make it, maybe you make the Friday. Then um, that's fine. Um, if you can just make the most of the weekend. Um, we'll be live streaming the presentations as well. So if you can't make it at all, then uh, you can tune in on Sunday. So if you check productforge.live, you'll see the link to the to the presentations. That's great. And also, if there's anyone kind of who's just interested in hackathons in general, or um, if there's something you think. Well, this is just one thing I'd like to tell the students who are going to be at this event. You know, I just had five minutes with them, and this was a piece of advice I would give, and I would be interested to hear that as well. Thank Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other? Any else at all wants to share? Oh, okay. So I think we'll cut a close. Uh, thanks again to, to Amazon and uh, Duncan for, for hosting tonight. Thanks very much. Thanks again to all our speakers. 
and to our speaker's co-hosts, my last one. <laughs> so um, next meetup uh, is not next sort of formal meetup is going to be September. We we normally skip August, back to a cultural thing where we cross it to Guildford. Um, we always skip August because we couldn't book out the little area at the back. So we normally skip August, but we're we're thinking of having a just a social uh, gathering in August. So that being, we just name a place and a. Probably the Guildford, actually. <laughs> we'll just gather there uh, in August for have a few drinks and we'll probably just be congregate at some part of the bar there and just have a, a, a chat and stuff. So that'll probably go on the meetup.com website in, in due course. Unless somebody else has got any other great idea they want to do in August. Um, but September, uh, venue's not been finalised yet. Um, but uh, just watch out on the, the site for that. Okay. So I think a few of us are going to cross the Guildford after this, if you want to join us there. If not, have a safe journey home. And thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thank you.